Hey there, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about spring and principally the great things you can grow in your garden in the spring to eat. I love to eat and I love to cook, but that's a whole other subject. Today we're just going to talk about some things that you ought to be thinking about for your spring garden. Now I've gotten several questions from you and uh, each week we're going to try to answer as many of them as we can. And the first one comes from Jennifer in Omaha, who I actually met at the Omaha Garden Show. It was just there a few weeks ago. And Jennifer's asking, Alan, when can I plant and what can I plant? It's still very cold here. Yes, it is in Nebraska. The thing you can begin to do in, in your part of the world is think about starting some of your seeds indoors, all right? It's really easy to do. You can get grow lights, you can get full kits. And Jennifer, you can start growing some of those plants and you can be ready to get them in the ground as you get close to that last frost date. It's really important to, to just Google and figure out what the last frost date is for your part of the world. Because there are a lot of vegetables that you can plant that will actually take the cold. And you can get some of those little transplants started. If you're like me, going through some of the seed catalogs, I love doing that in the winter when it's cold and I always place a big order. And when the seeds start arriving, um, I get the itch to get out there and start planting some of them. But in your part of the world where you're still getting a lot of snow right now, what I would recommend is that you get started um, inside with some things. And as soon as it warms up and, and you're not going to get temperatures that are dropping too far below freezing, go ahead and start planting in the ground. Now I mentioned some of the cool season vegetables and those are the things I'd like to focus on first because we've got a, a good stretch of time between between now, the, the, the late winter, uh, sort of that first week of March until we start planting the warm season vegetables. So let's focus on those cool season vegetables first. And those include things like broccoli, uh, the lettuces, a beautiful uh, red leaf cabbage here, more red leaf cabbage. And these are little transplants that you can see here. But you can also plant things like um, mustard greens, um, as well as onions and garlic this time of year. And if you're like me and you love root vegetables, such as carrots, um, uh, beets, for instance, now would be a good time to get some of those into the ground. But let's wind back just a few minutes and talk about doing some seed starting indoors. Usually I don't do root crop vegetables indoors, okay? Lettuce, yes, definitely. You can get some of those things started. And of course, some of those uh, summer vegetables, who doesn't love tomatoes? And you go through these catalogs and I mean, there's so many delicious varieties of tomatoes. And I promise coming up, we're going to do a segment on just tomatoes and some of the varieties that you really probably want to grow. Uh, but don't tempt me, I might jump into it this time. Um, one of the things that I've found very helpful is uh, to understand what that seedling, what that seed really needs, all right? If you're going to grow some of your things indoors, um, one of the things I suggest is a heat mat. Um, heat mats are uh, very simple. Uh, they, they, they're, they're electrical. You plug them in. They're typically about the size of a flat. You've bought a flat of vegetables. Uh, or you get some of these kits and you see the trays that you start the seed in. Um, these things are very thin kind of plastic, but they have a, a, a fiber in them that warms and uh, very thin uh, sheet, just almost like a heavy plastic. And um, they're waterproof, so you don't have to, to worry about that. And they're very safe to use. I always get a little nervous when I'm mixing electricity or heat and water, but uh, these work very well. So what you can do is just place this um, on, your, on your table, typically a, kind of a, a, a grow table with grow lights, and uh, place the tray on it with the seedlings. This warms the soil uh, and makes the little seed and eventually the seedling feel like it's spring. A few tips on growing some of these things. If you're like me, you like to save everything, right? Mm -hmm. So um, all these little plastic um, trays and containers over the years, I will save and I will reuse to start some of my favorite vegetables. 
Um, if you go to the nursery, you'll often find the standard things. And one of the beauties of, of getting on a list of nurseries who will send you a catalog is you've got all these varieties of vegetables that you can, you can pour over and you can select for your garden and grow some really interesting things. But I kind of mix it up. Typically, I'll, I'll have things that I will sow directly into the soil, other things that I'll start, and then there are things that I'll, just standard things I'll pick up at the local garden center. But the thing you always want to remember if you're a recycler like I am, is that you want to make sure that you clean these trays, these uh, little cell packs, these things that we don't really want to throw away that are plastic. And what you can do is you can just take a big galvanized tub, fill it full of water, and just put a couple of tablespoons of bleach, uh, put these things in there, let them soak for a few minutes, pull them out. And what the bleach will do is it'll kill any of these pathogens, these, these soil-borne uh, problems that can occur, mainly uh, fungus or even insect eggs that might be harboring in the soil. So please do that. The second thing that I've learned is don't reuse soil, okay? Use that for your containers that you're planting for outdoors a little later in the season. But if you're starting seedlings, start with a potting soil or a soil that is actually designated for starting seedlings. This is absolutely sterile. And so again, you're not going to be bringing in pathogens into your little greenhouse where you're growing these things or under your light or wherever you're growing them, okay? Those are very important and it's really easy to do. And you can save money by saving some of these things. I just keep them stocked and stored in the potting shed in the corner. And this time of year, I pull them out, uh, give them a good clean up just by dumping them into a galvanized wash tub with a little bleach and that's all you have to do. Okay, so here's another question. This one's for Charles from Monroe, Louisiana. Um, probably warming up down, down that way by now, Charles. And the question is, um, how do I direct sow seed? I've never planted seed. I've only planted uh, plants that I've picked up at the nursery. Well, uh, th this is a, a question. I think a lot of people are afraid of seed. So Charles, you're, you're not worried. You, you probably have a seed phobia. Um, these tiny little inert things that we're, we, we look at and we go, how in the world could we take something that is inert and tiny like this? This is a beautiful red onion seed that I have here. But you can see just how tiny they are. The key to this in the soil, directly in the soil, um, is, is about getting the soil texture right, okay? So we can talk about soil fertility, that's one thing, and then we can talk about the composition of the soil. And, and what you want is you want a soil that is very, um, what they call friable. You can, you can reach in there, you can grab it, you can hold it, and, it'll just, and squeeze it, and it'll just fall apart in your hands. You, you know what I'm talking about. This is typically a soil that has a lot of humus in it, all right? So it doesn't bind together. It's not a heavy clay kind of soil. Think about those tiny little seed trying to germinate in heavy clay. When they try to do that, well, your gardening efforts aren't likely to be very successful. So I really recommend getting the soil right. Um, if I have heavy clay soil, I will add a good bit of sand. I'll add a good bit of humus, and humus can take the form of many things. It can be well-rotted leaves. If you're a composter, you can use compost, which is fantastic. Uh, you can use peat moss. Peat moss isn't as, isn't as sustainable as other things that we have on hand that can serve as a form of humus. And this is just decayed organic matter. And what you're doing is you're just trying to loosen that soil. And when you break that soil down where it's uh, very fine um, and, and, and plant on a day when it's not too wet, um, just plant these seeds based on what the seed pack says. And what I tend to do is is, is cover the seed with just a little bit of, of sand and a mix of the soil over the tops of this, a very small seed. If you've planted lettuce uh, or carrots, you know that the seeds are very, very small. And so you just want to take your time and just drop those seed along. You've probably even seen some of these seed tapes where they've sort of taken the guesswork out of the spacing of them. But just kind of take your time and drop them along the little furrow that you create, and then gently 
water those seed in. And that's where the old fashioned watering can comes in. And what, what you have at the end of the can, the spout, are all these tiny little holes. And if you just gently tilt that, you're gonna get what feels like a gentle rain over that row of seed that you've just planted. And it'll be important that you keep that area of the garden uh, moist as these little seedlings begin to 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 emerge from from that inert little seed. It's it's an absolute miracle. I think it's one of the reasons that I love gardening and I love springtime gardening because it's it gives me such a sense of of renewal and rebirth, quite literally. Now. What we like to do is plant our vegetables in raised beds. Why? Well, it's easier to manage, frankly, and I can get the soil mix that I want. Um, it's also a way to keep the weeds out because you're elevating uh, the soil and you're bordering it. And what we typically use is a, a two by eight lumber, uh, sometimes a two by six lumber. The, the taller really the better, a, a two by 12 would be fantastic. Um, and with, with that, we can add the soil and get the soil just the way we want it. And it makes it more challenging for weeds to jump over into the bed. So you're kind of cutting down on your, your maintenance. Now, I know I'm going on and on and on about how to plant a few seeds in the garden, but this is to help you get over that seed phobia. Uh, because it, it really is a delight to sow these seed directly into the ground. And what I've found is when I lay out my rows, uh, let's take lettuce, for example. What I may do is, is space those, those rows about a foot apart, which will allow me to come between them at the six inch mark and draw another line, dig out a little furrow, and plant another row of lettuce two weeks later. And so what you get is this successive uh, crop coming in so it doesn't all come in at the same time. This is a mistake that, that I had to learn the hard way a long time ago out of just sheer enthusiasm about getting out there and gardening. So it's like, oh, I got this full raised bed. It's 10 by 10. I'm going to do it all at one time and one variety of lettuce. Well, guess what? It all comes in all at the same time, and you've got enough lettuce to feed your end of the county and still have some left over. So plant successively and think about how many mouths you're going to feed at table um, and what you want at any given time. It's kind of fun to think about that because I grow what I like to eat, and that's what you should do too. Now think about your root vegetables too, because you can alternate your leafy uh, plants, like your, your lettuces, along with rows of beets. And, and the thinning of these plants is also important. I never throw away what I thin. Baby beet plants, baby lettuce plants, these are microgreens, and you can thin those out a little bit. And as you thin them, save them, wash them, and put them on the plate and enjoy them. They're absolutely delicious. Okay, so while we're on the subject of sort of mixing things up and sequential planting and so forth, I, I want to challenge you to think about your garden this way. Leave some room for flowers, okay? In the fall, um, I love to put tulips in the vegetable garden, and I'm telling you, it's an absolute stunner. We also put pansies and violas in the, in the vegetable garden. And what's interesting that just blows people away is, you can make a gorgeous salad out of all these spring greens using the viola and pansy blooms. And you can also eat the tulip petals, all right? So once the tulip begins to fade, take those petals off. No reason to waste them. Sprinkle them in a salad. It's beautiful. We do this with daylilies as well, but as you know, they're going to come along later in the summer. But the idea of combining these plants in different ways um, and using herbs and flowers mixed together can be very exciting. And it's a great way to learn uh, pattern and design and color and texture, all these elements and how they play together. Um, and it's also creating a diverse landscape, which is good for us and it's good for our friends, the pollinators. Uh, it's good for the environment generally. So think about mixing things up a little bit. It's one of my favorite um, I guess, exercises out in the vegetable garden 
uh, trying to sort of work that out. It's, it's just fun. The other thing to think about, I, I love to get kids involved. And, and some, some vegetables are a little trickier because the seed is, is so small. Um, and, other, and others, the seed are larger. So two root crop vegetables that maybe kids will snarl their nose at that are early, uh, early on producers are radishes. Um, maybe not a kid's favorite. Uh, beets uh, have a very a large seed that they can handle. Both of those root crops are easy for them to hold the seed and actually plant them and participate in that process of, uh, of growing a garden from seed. Uh, now, you can also find seed that are coated, um, the tiniest seed when they're coated with a, with a little bit of clay, it makes it so much easier to get the spacing right so that you don't have to, let's assume that you have 100% germination um, and you got a little generous with what you've planted. Um, if you have seed that are already coated in, in clay, you can see them very easily and you can space them so you don't have to come back and do some thinning so it cuts down on waste. So that's a, a relatively new way of, of purchasing and planting seed that you might keep in mind. And I think it's also easier for the little ones to, to get in there and help. Um, so check some of those out. You can find them in these catalogs and so forth. So let's carry on with some more questions here. It's always great to hear, hear from you all checking in with us. Uh, we're talking about vegetables today and getting started in the garden. Uh, we have an acre of vegetable garden at Moss Mountain Farm. Uh, for those of you who uh, have been out to see, see us, you've seen that vegetable garden. You probably have enjoyed a, a farm to table meal there, but um, an acre is a lot of vegetables to take care of and you really don't have to have a huge space. Uh, when we first started that garden, we had things sort of just rowed out in a traditional way. And after a while, I decided, yeah, this could be more interesting from a design standpoint and probably easier to maintain if we did raised beds. And so that's what we did. We did raised beds and made that garden um, a little more manageable. And I think visually more interesting. The other thing we do is we, we add containers in the garden. And, and that brings me to this question from, from Miranda in Nashville, who says she's um, a first time gardener. Uh, she has a balcony, she lives in an apartment, but uh, has, has really no place to, to, to plant vegetables and wonders if they will do well in containers. Now, Miranda, one thing I want you to keep in mind is the larger the container, the better. And I know you can't have a huge container out on your balcony, but what I have here is a, a, just a classic terracotta pot here that is uh, probably, uh, looks like an eight inch pot. This is really too small uh, to grow vegetables in because you, you can't really get enough soil volume in there and it's going to be prone to, to, to the soil's going to be prone to dry out. So you, it's going to be a challenge. So what I like to do is think about containers that um, are in that 20 inch to maybe 24 inch size where you can have some depth, uh, where moisture can be held. Uh, the roots are prone to, to reach for that moisture um, and you're going to get a stronger plant and, and hey, you can go off on a three day weekend and come back and your vegetables are going to be in good shape. What can you plant in containers? Well, just about anything you can grow in the soil. Um, I think light is a little challenging. If if I was there with you in your apartment looking at that balcony, the the direction would play a role in what I would plant. Um, if you if you have full sun, uh, western exposure, then that's good. This in the early spring by growing uh, a lot of these leafy greens and things like that. Uh, we haven't mentioned shard. But I love growing various types of shard. Ruby shard is beautiful. Uh, for years, we've grown one called peppermint shard. And I love it because it has these um, uh, very pink stalks um, uh, and then the leafy greens above. And every part of the plant is edible. So they're marvelous in sa sautés. But the, the beauty of the shard, in my opinion, as a plant uh, is that it has such an ornamental quality to it. And so for gardeners who are starting out or gardeners who have limited space and want, want something beautiful, but functional, 
Uh, Chard is right up there at the top of the list because of the foliage color of it, as well as some of these different lettuce types. Uh, you get the chartreuse green uh, oak leaf lettuces, for instance, with a leaf of the uh, lettuce actually looks like that of an oak. Uh, and then you, you get these very vertical romaine lettuces that can be, the red ones are very dark. And so you can get that kind of contrast in a container. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind is always put saucers uh, underneath these containers where you've got a constant source of water. And as you think about this, this light, the light conditions, we were talking about if you had full western sun, that's going to get pretty hot in the summer. Um, so a little protection from that afternoon sun is often helpful if that's possible. Or plant things that really like the heat. Uh, that you can eat, like a rosemary plant or oregano, any of the wonderful Mediterranean uh, plants, tomatoes, uh, 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 lavender, uh, these all love the heat and will thrive in, in full hot sun. If your apartment or balcony is on an east side, which I think would be probably ideal, you get all that morning light. So you get you know, all the light from dawn up until roughly noon. And in that in those sort of lighting conditions, you can grow almost anything. What happens is as the summer um, moves along, the day, the day length is, is uh, greater in, in the afternoon and you can really get some intense light. So for us in our world in zone eight uh, in the south here, it can get very hot on the west side of a building. So you have to think about in the summertime, what are you gonna grow that can really withstand the heat? Love mixing herbs in my, in my containers and in my garden. One of the things that I've done in the past uh, that I think you might want to think about, Miranda, is planting nasturtiums. Uh, nasturtiums are wonderful in containers. And again, we're talking about an edible flower here. Not only is it beautiful, but um, it will, there's some of the, so many of them are trailing and they will spill over the edge of your container. So think about this. You've got a 20 inch diameter container. You're going to line the outside of it with some nasturtium seed. And maybe in the center, you, you place a rosemary plant. And so you've got that vertical element. And then you've got these nasturtiums spilling off the edge. You've got a contrast of foliage with that almost evergreen, uh, needly uh, 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 texture of the rosemary, and then the round leaves of the nasturtiums, and then those gorgeous flowers. And every part of those plants is edible and usable. I love having rosemary around because um, I love the, the minced leaves in all kinds of cooking. And even the stems are marvelous for skewers. If you have a grill out on your, your patio or your terrace and you're grilling, you can use the skewers to, to pierce uh, lamb kebab, whatever you can, uh, or chicken or even vegetables. And the stem and the essential oils in that stem will flavor the food. So that's a, that's a great herb that I can't imagine not having, even if I just have to plant one every year and I can't winter it over. Well, that's about it for today's podcast. I want to thank you for joining me and I really appreciate all your questions. It's so much fun connecting with you all this way. So keep those questions coming. We'll cover them every week. And if you'd like to see a replay of this uh, on our YouTube channel, join our YouTube channel. Please subscribe and uh, you'll be able to see the, I, I suppose, the visual version of this podcast. Uh, make sure you sign up and come see us sometime at Moss Mountain Farm. We're there on Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, make a reservation, come have a farm to table lunch and walk around the farm. We'd love to have you. All right, until next time, get out there and get your hands in the soil and have some fun. 